Since organic producers have their own unique challenges, digital marketing shouldn't be one of them. You need uh, fewer chores and more wins. So in this presentation, John Nelson will cover helpful time-saving confidence building tactics to help you control and thrive online in the coming year. So whether you're an experienced website officer, officer, how about operator, or just getting started with digital tools, you'll come away from the presentation with some useful information on how to make digital market, marketing less than a chore. And so before John gets going, I'll just tell you a little bit about him. He's the creative director at Nine Clouds and leads a team of talented digital strategists. When he was little, he wanted to be a rancher, but nowadays, John helps to make livestock and egg products easier to sell online. So thank you so much, John, for being here today, and I will pass over to you. Thank you so much, Marla. That was a lovely introduction, and um, I am very honored to be here with you all today. I'm uh, phoning in from Sioux Falls, South Dakota today, where it's a uh, uh, balmy zero degrees today, and uh, I am excited to show you what I have here. I'm going to share my screen here. Um, one moment. All right. All right. So like Marla said, I'm a creative director at a digital marketing agency down here in South Dakota, and uh, I've been with the company for around 10 years. Um, I was originally going to have Jenny here. Jenny Lockhart is a co-director here, um, but she had a medical emergency this week, so she wasn't able to join, but she sends her regards. Um, I want to tell you a little bit of background about myself. Um, this is an interesting intersection in my life right now because I come from an ag family, and uh, when I was growing up, I had uh, the uh, opportunity to raise a lot of animals. I was a 4-H kid, and so um, I raised everything from poultry and mutton and swine and beef, and um, it's a big part of my life, and I'm really grateful for that. Um, I have a couple pictures here. These are my, my bobwhite quail that I raised um, when I was in seventh grade, um, and I, they ended up getting grand champion at our county fair down here in South Dakota. <laughs> um, and then this is me. Um, plants are also a big part of my life. Um, I grew up, my parents own a greenhouse nursery business. And so um, I had an unfair advantage in our, our uh, science fair in middle school here. So <laughs> um, anyway, uh, I just wanted to give you a little background about myself. Today, we're going to be talking about digital marketing, and I want to show you some exciting tactics to help you reach leads and consumers, whether you do freezer beef or direct sales of livestock. Um, I want to help you um, find and reach those consumers at the right time. I want to talk a little bit about how you can productize your animals or your beef um, to interested buyers, and then also reinforce a sense of community and purpose, which I know is very important for this group. I do have a case study that I want to show you. Um, this is the closest example I could come up with for this presentation, but um, we do have did some work with a, a cattle broker down here um, in Wyoming, and um, we did have some good experience with him um, and we used a lot of tactics that I think will be useful for everyone here. So I'm going to share that case study and I also have some tips and tricks and also some key takeaways. So um, I'm trying to keep things brief here so we have time for Q&A at the end. <clears throat> uh, there's still hope on Facebook. This is a question that we get a lot at our agency. Um, is it worth it to spend money on Facebook ads? And I did a little research yesterday about um, the key interests. And these are all things that are in Canada. I had to verify that they do translate across the border, but um, we, we have a way of including and excluding certain interests and then also combining interests on Facebook. And I'm not trying to get in the weeds on purpose. I'm not trying to go over, go over anyone's head here, but just know that uh, you can narrow down your audience to find specifically what you want, whether they're, they're interested in organic beef or hormone-free products, that sort of thing. Um, you can combine the, the person's persona or their, their, um, their, their job with these other interests. And so that's a unique feature in Facebook that lets you mix and match things. Um, so here you can see at the top, we have dietary uh, restaurant tour, beef cooking meats. And then of course you, 
uh, can narrow it down and say they must also be interested in conservation, medical or natural environment, natural products, organic products, um, everything in your field. So um, when I looked in here, I was surprised to see that in the prairie provinces alone, and I know you market beef more widely than this, but um, there's some comfort in knowing that there's uh, at least 1.4 million people who are who, who meet these criteria here. So, all right, so I'm gonna get into uh, the case study. Um, we had a uh, an interesting lead come to us a couple of years ago about um, they wanted to connect the more buyers and sellers together. They themselves didn't raise beef, but they, they knew that there were people out there who were um, sick and fed up with their local weekly markets um, because uh, they were skimming off the top and they wanted to have more margin, right? So um, we found that we can use digital marketing to reach more consumers directly and also sell cattle directly um, from rancher to rancher rather than getting them shipped to a stockyard or a local market and stressing out these cattle and the ranchers. Um, and so they had com changing communication channels. Everything is digitizing. The next generation is coming through and taking over the reins on marketing. And so they want to find new ways that aren't, um, aren't prohibitive to their natural rhythm on their ranches. And, and uh, another thing was just finding people who were interested in selling their cattle lots um, here in the upper Midwest. And then also uh, they do still, uh, in, in most cases, they have leads who don't want to give their email address. They, they want phone calls. Um, it's just the way things are done in this community. So um, how do, our challenge was how can we still leverage online tools that result in a very traditional conversion in the form of a phone call. Um, and so we were able to launch some ads uh, for them and also optimize their websites, get everything up to snuff so that they were sh showing up in search results. Um, and then also pushing some Facebook ads so that they could get in front of those ranchers who might not expect to find other ranchers on, on a social media. So through the course of a few months, we actually increased their organic search traffic for this one website um, over 200%. We get uh, over 6,500 new visitors from Google ads alone and 6,300 visitors from Facebook ads. Um, we also have since gone from a, from a traffic model to a click to call model. And so they're getting uh, phone calls uh, phone call ads that are scheduled during the day so they can only get phone calls from Facebook when they want to rather than ringing uh, overnight. So um, it's a really, really good case for us. Um, and uh, there's more details about this on ninecloudscom I don't want to carry on about our own work. I'm, more, I'm here for you. So uh, let's get into the marketing funnel. Those of you who have been in the game for a while might be familiar with this, but this is the model that we use to think about reaching more livestock producers or livestock purchasers online. Um, we have tactics at each stage of the, this funnel that I'm going to show you. Starts with awareness, or what we call top of funnel or tofu, um, and then it goes down to consideration. Um, they're weighing their options for where they're going to purchase. They might be coming to the farmer's market week after week, and then they slowly become aware of of you as a vendor, or, or they might find you online and revisit your website. At that point, they're gonna figure out who your competition is, and then they're gonna make a decision. So that's when they convert to the third part. And then finally, after they convert and buy your product, um, you're gonna want a strategy so that they come back to you or evangelize for your business and then grow from there. <clears throat> All right. so. Things you'll need to get started uh, to make prospects more aware of you, you got to become more aware of them. This is logical for anybody who's run any sort of business, but it's especially important in, um, in, a, in a market where you have multiple types of consumers. So you might have uh, school, uh, schools or uh, dietary departments at hospitals, or you might have um, people who are just coming to a booth at a farmer's market. Um, it's a wide range of people that you might talk to in this industry. So um, you need to really literally write down who these people are. What is, 
who is it that you're trying to reach and then start to collect the data around these people so that you can organize and segment them when you when it comes time to uh, set up your targeting. So at the top of the funnel, we're increasing the number of prospects, uh, identifying those locations where your consumers hang out online. And in a lot of cases, these are pretty familiar sites, uh, places like YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, um, TikTok, things like that. And it's, it's places where um, a, a large mixture of people meet. So you need to get really good at identifying the people who are in your group. Um, how do their purchases work? Um, how, what is the process if you're a, um, let's say you're a dietary manager at a nursing home, um, what is their process for procuring, um, organic beef? How did, how do they get there? How do you connect A to, a to B? Um, and then also who are they making decisions with? How do they place orders? Um, and then why do they choose organic livestock or products? I think we all have the answers in our head. Like, of course it's, um, uh, it's animals that are free of antibiotics or hormones or they're free range. We all know the benefits of this, but um, your audience might not have it at the top of their minds. So at the awareness stage, we're also talking about um, the different tactics. So on your website, you, you may, many of you may already have blogs. You may have even have white papers or eBooks. Um, you may even do webinars such as this one. I, I, I know there's a lot of tactics out there, but you need to do what works for you at this stage of the funnel. And so whether it's regular posting on social media or just publishing something that's syndicated on a predictable basis, I think you need to have some way for people to begin a relationship with you that's not just buying your product. Um, so what can you do to get your name out there that's not going straight for the conversion, but is providing value for your audience. All right, so we're gonna move down the funnel here to the consideration stage. This is your time to shine. Uh, this is where you have all the information on your site that people would wanna know about your product. So they're aware that you sell organic beef, but what do you have? What's, what's actually available? And so if you pr can provide that information consistently, um, instructions on how to order are really important here. Um, this is where uh, you will begin retargeting strategies or email strategies to reach out to these people. At the decision stage, it's time to connect with your audience. Uh, you have different forms and points of sale. Uh, you need to show examples of people buying from you. This is really important and it's often overlooked. Um, your people who, who leave your five-star reviews on Google, you can repurpose those reviews for this type of thing. You can put examples and put the customer's voice on your website or your social media showing examples of happy customers. And also uh, your sales materials and brochures. I know a lot of you might be doing print brochures or, or other mailer type things. Um, you need to uh, have those at the ready at this stage. And then uh, at the growth stage, after people know who you are and they've already maybe placed one or two orders, you need to have partnership-minded content. You need to show them that this is a community um, that you're committed to as a vendor, as a rancher, or as a, um, as a marketer for, for these um, organizations. And so reputation management is big. And um, I know with, with this industry, specifically with organic and regenerative, um, you need to be ready with facts. So when, when people are trolling <laughs> on social media, something that we're really familiar with here in the States, um, it's something that uh, where preparedness really diffuses any sort of drama that happens online. So be ready to defend and defend and explain things clearly for people who might not be familiar with this. Um, this is a big thing in South Dakota too. I mean, it people who have never bought organic beef before have a lot of skepticism and it's easy to understand why. Um, not everything is about the dollar. So, um, and then also referral pro programs are, are another key tactic here. Um, if you have people who are, are really great customers, you might want to let them know that you can provide a, a, some sort of incentive for them to tell the, their friends about you um, and come back time after time. All right, so I'm gonna get into some tactics here. I wanna keep things moving. 
Um, we're going to breeze through some tactics uh, for Facebook and Google specifically. Um, you want to show up in search results with good content. It's not just about your name or your brand, but about the helpfulness that you're willing to provide when you show up on Google. Uh, building awareness and trust with Facebook posts. Like I said earlier, you want to show up um, regularly, whatever that means for you, whether it's once a week, once a month, once a day. Uh, just do it consistently so that people can start to build some trust and confidence in your brand. All right. So um, as a bonus, I wanted to put this in here. Uh, this, is a, this is a tip that we give a lot of our clients here at our agency is use your slow time to do some thinking and to do some analysis. You need to analyze results, conduct split tests if you're running ads, uh, draft campaigns, um, for the future, just be prepared for the seasonality of your business and, um, and just think ahead. So a lot of posts and, and ads these days can be scheduled well into the future. So if you know that in the fall, you're going to be talking about a specific product um, or you're going to have a specific event, there's no harm in setting that up ahead of time. Um, and, and so I have a couple examples here from a ranch uh, that help, helps uh, other ranchers buy and sell cattle, um, direct, uh, direct marketing here. Um, all right, so I, I did want to give a heads up that we do at Nine Clouds, we have an ebook available that is specifically about Facebook and Instagram. And I think this might be useful for a lot of you. Um, if you are interested in this, just put your email address in the chat here or send me an email at johnnelson at ninecloudscom um, I'd be happy to send that to you. All right, so um, I do have some other things here specifically for Facebook. Uh, at the awareness stage, you can do lookalike targeting based on website traffic or CRM lists if you have lists of your customers. Um, you can upload those into Facebook and then let Facebook find the people who are like your customers. Um, that's in addition to the awareness to, or the, sorry, the uh, interest-based targeting that I was talking about earlier. On Google, you have solution-oriented keywords that um, are really important. There's a nuance to the keywords that you advertise for on Google. You want to find the ones that indicate that a person is ready uh, to purchase something or is researching something. Um, if they are trying to find the, the hormone-free beef in Manitoba, um, you might want to look at that keyword and, and put it in your campaign. Um, the other thing is in LinkedIn, uh, job title targeting is really good. Um, the, it's a really effective way to get people who are, are certain a certain type of decision maker. So getting, getting your information in front of the, the very specific personas that you define on LinkedIn. General community targeting is really great. I know um, uh, before this started, we were talking about bees <laughs> with the organizers here. And, and there's a, a whole community about any sort of um, ecological or uh, conservation type thing that is adjacent to this uh, organic and um, regenerative market. So um, those types of communities have a, have a big overlap. I think of it as a, as a Venn diagram that in the center of that Venn diagram, you're going to find uh, a really good return on your, on your investment for advertising. Um, doing source analysis, looking back and seeing where did your past customers come from for like the last 365 days. Uh, that's another powerful thing. And then inviting people to explore your site. I think this is often overlooked in messaging is uh, you'll say, we have beef, um, but then what's next? What do you want that person to actually do after they read your, your post about how good organic beef is? Um, we put a call to action on everything so you know you're providing that next step. All right, ad content. Um, there's uh, uh, We're pretty short on time here, so I'm going to keep going, but uh, just know that you need to have relevant, timely, and original content in your ads. You don't want to look exactly like every other um, every other beef producer in Canada. You want to be uh, the solution for why why buy cattle online. Why why do I need organic beef? Um, it's just as simple as that. Um, I have a couple of more examples of ads for this awareness phase. Um, this is an, a bull sale event down here. Uh, it was in Nebraska, I believe. Um, just getting uh, uh, getting an, an example of 
putting your ads in front of people who might not be aware of you, or that might be the very first time that you've seen um, the, the event or the product that people have. Um, consideration advertising, uh, increasing conversion at this phase. Again, Facebook and Google, this is where your retargeting comes in. You need to stay in front of people because it's very rare that people will purchase something on their very first visit to your website. Um, that's where uh, the consideration marketing really makes a big impact. Um, so at, at this phase, the big question is why do I need organic beef from a Manitoba ranch versus a uh, regular beef from Walmart? This is where they're weighing their options. Um, and then this leads into the decision phase. So this, these are again, the same bull sale with retargeting. All right. Um, decision advertising. This is where you're providing information to known contacts using dynamic retargeting, which is like uh, if you've ever shopped on Amazon, um, this, these are the types of ads that show you exactly what you were shopping for on a website. You can do that same thing with, with livestock. And uh, as long as you can fill out a spreadsheet, you can run those types of ads uh, using custom audiences. Uh, there's Google retargeting, LinkedIn, outreaching to known contacts. This is where they are making key decisions. Um, and then lastly, ad content at the decision phase, procedural next step or how to buy from us information, like I said earlier, and why buy your product service right now. So this is where your incentives make a big difference. Here's some decision uh, marketing, again, uh, retargeting, um, and then also branding, like what is the difference between them and another cattle vendor? We communicate, we care, that sort of thing. All right. Um, LinkedIn, uh, again, growth advertising with known contacts. Uh, we need to get our custom audiences and friends of friends engaged. I'm going to keep moving here because we, we do have uh, limited time here. I want to give you this time-saving checklist. Uh, there's a few slides here. Uh, firstly, claim and manage your listings on Google. This is really important. Um, and it's not just a Google thing, actually. I did put Apple Maps and Bing as well. Um, there's also a tool called Moz Local, which will help you sync all of your various listings, whether your, your operation shows up um, in Yellow Pages or Google or Apple or wherever, you can make sure that you're showing up consistently with the same phone number, same email, same website. Install a Facebook pixel. If, you, if you're on Facebook, I can't, I can't stress how important it is to have an integration with your website. Um, talk to your web administrator, uh, get this piece of code from Facebook for free uh, and put it on your website. It allows you to retarget visitors to your site. Um, it also allows you to get specific um, with your targeting. So it's not just anybody who comes to the site, but people who might have viewed the, uh, the frozen beef section of your site. Um, and then you can retarget them with very relevant ads. Um, Business.facebook.com is where you're going to want to go for that. Track leads and sales in a CRM spreadsheet. If you're not doing this, you're missing out. You need large lists to get ads going um, for, for direct advertising. Um, and email marketing is, is a, still a great tool. You know, email marketing now... It, um, email itself is about 50 years old already, believe it or not. And so um, it's going to be around for a while. And I, I think people scoff at email marketing because it is so old, but it, there's a reason it's been around for a while. So don't skip out on that. Um, segmentation by customer type is really important. So commercial schools, individuals, you get the picture there. Tracking ROI, uh, there's a thing called Facebook offline events. So after you run an ad, you can go back and upload your month or year list of sales and leads, and it'll tell you how many people saw your ad or clicked on your ad before uh, converting as a lead or purchasing. It's a really valuable thing to get return on ad spend. And reach out. Um, I always tell people, know your nerds. Um, if you are a rancher, um, you know, in a lot of cases, you might not be, if you're the person who's feeding the cattle, you may not be the person who built the website, but you may be the person who bought the website. And so you need to know the people who have the nuts and bolts and who can actually implement things like a pixel confidently and set you up for success in the future.
Still hope on Facebook. I already put this in. Don't forget that it, it's uh, important here. Um, the key takeaways for you, align the goals with your ads with actual business oriented outcomes. Get, get creative with tactics. Don't try the same thing over and over, but be consistent in your approach. Engage skeptics respectfully with facts and stay positive. Incorporate new tools and technology when you need a boost. All right. That leads me to the end. What questions do we have? Absolutely, open it up to questions. And thank you so much, John. I mean, that was a really uh, great sort of gallop through, which I think is really important because for me, um, you know, we do we do social media marketing for you know for Sask Organics. So some of this has been you know really interesting for me, and it's allowed me to see the potential, demystify some of it, and also realize what I don't know. <laughs> right, and then I love the last point. You know, know your nerds, and I'm in my head going, where are the you know where are the people that I need to to talk to 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 help you know to help us out with this. Um, so thank you uh, again for that. Um, is, do we have any questions? I don't, I don't, oh, that's a really good question. So where to start? So as a new producer, what would be your advice? Like what's the first step? The first step as a new producer, um, I think it would be to establish your brand and think a lot about how you're gonna show up consistently. So it's more than just a logo, right? Um, and more than just a brand name, but um, finding good homes for those things. So your Facebook page is gonna be, I would argue is probably your number one priority at this stage. And then also your Google Google listing. Um, if you go to that link that I, that I showed earlier, uh, the, <laughs> Um, I can't remember the, the name of it, but it's uh, Google uh, Business Console. I, it's, it's escaping my mind, but there's yeah. a Google Business Hub where you go in and, and create your map listing, but it's also your Google listing for search results. Um, so you need to go in and get that consistent. But the number one tip is just be consistent with how you show up more than just the logo, but your tagline, your phone number, your email, um, it needs to be familiar on that second visit for people. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's really good advice. And I just think to the whole, you know, relationship building and relationship building through storytelling, right? Yep. I think that that's what we all, in, you know, that's what brings me back somewhere. It's like, oh, what's happening today? Like I can think of, you know, one uh, entrepreneur in Regina that I follow on social media and, or on Instagram and, you know, I'm, I'm interested to know what she's doing next, right? And, and she's created an engaging story for, for people to follow along with. So, um, you know, there's no doubt that this takes work <laughs> and investment of time, right? But I think, um, you know, at least watching this uh, young woman's business grow, uh, it's working for her, that investment of, of time. So um, are there any other, any other questions? And I'm keeping track of the time too, because John said that uh, you are going to uh, uh, stay for the networking sessions. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, excellent. That's awesome. So, I see oh, somebody Lauren has his hands up. Hand up. Excellent. Hi, Lauren. Hi. Um, I, I'm a primary producer and not techie at all. <laughs> Is there are there any companies, or does your company offer a service that would take care of all of that marketing? Um, and, and how, where should I go from here? Yeah, we, we do serve, uh, we do serve livestock producers here at our agency. And so it's something that we would be willing to, to look at with you, um, to see if we can find a solution. Absolutely. I'm not sure if you can hear me, John. We can. Yes, now. Can. yes absolutely. Okay, I was just curious to what percentage of the meat sold in, say, maybe Saskatchewan would actually be organic? Ooh, that's a good question. I I don't have the stats off the top of my head. I'd have to do a little searching. Um, I, I do know that the percentage of people, like when I did this Facebook example, um, you know, 1.4 million is probably around, I would guess, 20 to 30% of the total population in uh, in um, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and Manitoba, and I did notice that Alberta has quite a bigger population, right? I think it's because of Edmonton, 
but um, I think, um, you know, if I were to guess just ballpark, I would say it's around 10 to 15%. Perfect. Uh, there's a lot of people that are growing uh, their meat organically, but it's not, they're not really marketing it as organic. Do you know what I'm saying? Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. Because of the, you know, all the hurdles and stuff. Do you know, are, are more people slowly getting into marketing organic beef or is it getting easier? Um, I, boy, I, I again, I'm, I'm not 100% sure because I haven't worked with it directly um, with the organic side of things, but I do know that um, it takes time, right? Like you're, it's, it's like you're selling two brands at once. You have the concept of selling this product that is already an underdog. And then you're also marketing the brand that's selling that product. So it's, it's a kind of a catch 22. Um, I work with a lot of auto dealers and they have a tiered system of thinking about this. So if you think of Ford, for example, um, they would be like tier one and they're responsible for making the, to, for selling you the F-150 before you even get to the dealership. They sell you on the idea of buying your F-150 at tier two, it's your regional. Um, and so that would be the groups like this, right? Like that are, that have something in common, a more community based, it's more based on a region. And then at tier three is, is your producer where you're at. And so your job isn't necessarily why buy an F-150, but why buy it now from me? And so it's not necessarily about what you're selling, but how you, how you frame the questions that people have. Um, and so that, that's kind of an analogy to, to just say um, there's a difference between convincing people to buy organic beef and buying organic beef from you. You know, they might be at a different stage in that, in that funnel. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's perfect. Thank you. And I think that leads us um, very nicely into our next session. So uh, thank you again, John, for your presentation. And there were a number of folks who dropped their email into the chat function. All so right. um, they're interested in, in receiving your ebook. So that's, that's fantastic. And uh, now on to our next session. So we'll now hear from uh, Mike Beretta of Beretta Farms. Uh, Mike founded Canada's most recognized meat brand 25 years ago. As a rancher, butcher, and business leader, Mike oversees a vertically integrated business that manages animals, a harvesting facility, sales, and distribution. The company's brand are sold across Canada as well in the US, Europe, the EU, Asia, and the Middle East. The company has strived to be a leader in the humane animal treatment, traceability, and meat quality. You can find Mike's full bio in the program. So please join me in welcoming Mike Beretta. Over to you, Mike. We can't hear you. Now try. Hmm, no. <laughs> Dang. Samantha, any suggestions? One person suggested leaving and coming back in. Can yeah, that's what I was going to suggest too. Oh, oh we, we can, can hear you can now. Hear you. Yes, we oh, can. <laughs> awesome. Thanks. Sorry, all of a sudden when I went to talk, it said you're muted. So I'm not mistaken. I right. use this all the time. So that's right, all good. Thank you. Thanks for the intro, Marla. Um, and, and thanks to John. I think John was far more technical and way more savvy in social media than, than I am. But I think what I can offer here is uh, a real life perspective of, of our ranch and what we do insofar as uh, using social media to market our, our products. So if I just say next slide, maybe Marla, um, can someone just flip the slides and we'll go we'll that way then? Perfect. That's okay, perfect, so, uh, thank you. Great, so I thought we'd just put it in the um, kind of in context a little bit, the timeline of our business. So my wife and I started this 
um, endeavor 30 years ago with two pigs. Uh, we made the, the big mistake of naming them, something we've never done in the 30 years since. But uh, and there's a little picture there of me with those very first two pigs not having come from a farming background. And um, we, we fattened them and sold, sold the pork to friends and family. And we absolutely fell in love with, with both the production and farming side as well as the marketing side. And this was again, back in 92. Um, I, I enrolled in the, at the University of Guelph and studied agriculture because I knew nothing. And we kind of built our business from scratch with a clean, clean uh, chalkboard. Um, and in, by 1995, we were raising cattle and chickens as well as, as the pigs. And then in, uh, at the end of 95, in October, we ended up uh, having a, a terrible barn fire and we lost all our livestock and the barn. And we were very fortunate the following year to have our local Mennonite community come and raise a barn in a one day event like you've seen in some of the movies before. And that was a real um, groundbreaking moment for us because it kind of, it made it clear that we had chosen uh, um, the pathway to stay in agriculture and stay in direct marketing. And we've really never looked back since then. And, um, at that time, we were primarily just doing direct to home delivery using third party, like local butchers. And in 97, we bought a small abattoir and a butcher shop in, in Brussels, Ontario, which we then gave us the ability to customize how we cut our products. And, and um, uh, we were able to meet customers unique requests and stuff a little better by having that hands on ability. And in 2000, we moved to King City, which is a uh, a town straight north of Toronto to a larger farm and we certified it and we began doing everything uh, out on pasture. It was a very rolly land that didn't, wasn't conducive to cropping in any way, um, but it, it led us down the path of, of grass farming and regenerative agriculture. Um, I wanted to point out a couple timelines for us or milestones rather. A, a big one was Whole Foods coming to Canada in 2002. Uh, they became our largest customer and they really propelled us into into uh, uh, the whole marketing and branding side. And we learned a lot more about what it meant to build a brand and to turn that into something that people wanted and be able to deliver it. And um, in 2014, we, were, um, we had long since outgrown production on our farm in King City. And we were um, partnering with other farmers in Ontario. And we had started also working with some ranchers in Alberta and Saskatchewan and our cattle numbers were growing. And we had an opportunity in 2014 to acquire a federal facility in Lacombe, Alberta, which we went ahead and did. And um, that really opened up further markets and having the ability to access federal processing uh, certainly al allowed us to tap into that. And in 2020, two of our children joined the business full time. My daughter went to school in Olds, uh, Olds College in Alberta, and she came home and she's running our our cattle production side, as well as the pigs. And um, my oldest son came back from studying business in the United States, and he is um, our head of operations at this point. And we presently, um, our head office employs about 20 people full time. And the, um, and the office is based still in King City on the original farm. So maybe we'll flip to the next. So the, the brands that we sell under uh, over time have evolved and they make up those, the four main ones you see in front of you. So Beretta, uh, Heritage Angus, Greta Kitchen and Black Apron. Uh, Beretta is where our organic uh, meat is sold under as well as some of our natural. And it is also some of the EU. Uh, Heritage Angus beef, as the name denotes is strictly Angus. And it's also, um, that brand is actually only exported our kitchen catering it does catering predominantly in Ontario and Black Apron are animals that neither have fallen out of either our organic or of our natural programs. Um, so they've been treated at some time in their life, but still have not had any uh, hormones. And we call them Black Apron and we use that kind of as our cleanup brand to ensure that the other brands um, don't lose too much money with animals that, that have to get treated and fall out. I thought it would be uh, uh, helpful to, to also indicate that we use a variety of sales channels to get our product into the marketplace. Uh, E-commerce is um, something we've been doing for quite a while, but it really took off with COVID. Uh, in uh, March, 2020, I think our, our business just shot up. Uh, we do deliveries in our own trucks and that's predominantly in Toronto. It's all online, uh, customers order online, 
and the product goes right to the uh, end user. And we deliver right to homes, um, condos, et cetera. Uh, a big channel for us is food service. That includes um, larger restaurants, some restaurant chains, a lot of uh, burger chains, such as A&W or Harvey's, things like that. We have a catering division, which is what Beretta Kitchen is. It allows us to utilize some of the off cuts. If we have dark cutters, uh, B grades, things like that, we can, uh, it's amazing what a great cook or chef can do, uh, turning that product into a, a very tasty meal. So our catering business is, uh, um, it's predominantly in Ontario. And we actually specialize with uh, professional sports teams that are based in Toronto and those that fly in and out of Toronto. So uh, mostly the basketball, baseball and hockey teams. Uh, wholesale, we split into two. We have a large wholesale, um, which includes uh, customers say like a Loblaws or a TNT and then small wholesale, which are accounts that would have two or three stores in total as part of their uh, enterprise. Uh, mentioned earlier export, we do a fair bit of exporting of, of meat products. Uh, predominantly beef and predominantly the EU uh, as well as um, Middle East and we've dabbled a little bit in China and then a couple of years ago we started doing a farmer's market every two weeks on our home farm and it's become um, a real success and really exciting for staff as well as obviously customers coming and so it, it's become a new sales channel and it allows us to play around with new products and offer, uh, do some like R&D with customers by, by virtue of the farmer's markets. Anyway, we're on to the next. So marketing strategy, which is what this is, I guess, supposed to be all about. Uh, uh, I was trying to think of a clever way to define it. And I think the simplest way is, is indicating that our, our tagline defines our marketing strategy, which is sharing what matters. So um, when we look at any branding initiatives marketing initiatives, uh, we tend to always think about what we're sharing and make sure it's something that we think matters and that people should know. And we use that kind of as the premise of, of, of any of the platforms that, that um, we would then employ to, to access the customer. I, I do wanna say that bar none, I was talking to my daughter a little bit about this in light of this um, conversation. Uh, if I had a choice between any of those four platforms that you see in front of you or the website, I still believe websites are, are the strongest method of getting um, interacting with customers. I know it's harder uh, to, to, we think it's harder to be able to catch people's attention in, in, out in the internet with all the uh, websites and everything that are, that are out there. But I think there are ways, I know John in the earlier conversation mentions e-blasts. We still do a lot of email blasts and find they're probably the single best way of, of interacting with customers. But of the, of the social media platforms you see across the bottom, we do use all four, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. I think Instagram uh, would generally be our most used um, uh, platform. We tend to use it a lot for imagery and video content. We find we get a lot of reaction when we share ranch life, like not pose ranch life videos, but which is actual day-to-day -day kind of stuff that we might take for granted, but, uh, but a customer in, in an urban center might find absolutely fascinating. We find that animals, showing animals really resonates a lot. Uh, I think back in the early days, we thought it would be very hard to um, show off or showcase animals when we're selling meat, but we find that most people really enjoy knowing that we care about animals and they're appreciative of the fact that we take the time to um, showcase our animals, despite the fact that we're, we're in the meat business. Uh, Facebook, we use a little bit more for talking about events and sharing uh, uh, things that are going to be happening, either events within the business or events we think are worth our customers being aware of. We also use Facebook on, with regards to product, product launches, things like that. Uh, Twitter, we use the least, probably of the, of the four. We find it tends to be a, a, more like a real-time reminder. So we'll use it on days of, of specific events or day before, say, of a market or of a, an open house or a, a cattle move that we're going to be doing down the road, things like that. We find Twitter very useful uh, in that regard. And LinkedIn tends to be more on a professional level. I think we, we, we tend to use it more as an educational tool 
with more of a professional clientele um, in mind. Uh, we'll share articles that we think are valuable um, that talk about regenerative agriculture or grass farming or um, meat consumption and things like that. We find LinkedIn is a, a little more highbrow, if you were, of the four, and we tend to um, try, tend to try and use it in that vein. So, um, if the next slide we take a peek at, we what I thought I'd do is kind of give some examples for those of you that are new into using these social media platforms. These are just random. We grabbed five um, recent posts or relatively recent posts to kind of give you a sense of the kind of things that we would showcase. The beauty with, with uh, Instagram, of course, and John maybe mentioned this, but um, you're able to also retweet what other people say. So uh, sometimes the, the two on the, on the left, I think, came from accounts of ours, one in BC, I think, and one in Quebec. And so um, if they take the time to post or say something or share something with their customers, it allows us to take that and then uh, um, further share it with, with our host of followers. Uh, the one in the middle is an example of a cattle move down the road where King City is surrounded by um, subdivisions and a lot of housing. So something as simple as moving the cattle a concession or two over to another pasture becomes a, a real event. And it's fun to share that on Instagram. And I think it really resonates. Um, the jerky picture is an example of using products and pointing out new products um, that we might be offering or have a sale on. And then the one on the far right is an example of my daughter doing her day-to-day -day routine, but trying to pick out things that uh, people might find that really interesting. So thanks to the Beretta brand, but we'll use any of these platforms specifically for, for depending on, on what we think the customer is looking for at that time. So uh, the next slide would be, I believe, uh, the Facebook. So again, more on the event side, you'll see on the far right, an example of a market. Uh, we call out a Beretta Farms market, and this is the date. And, and it allows us also to, um, people will comment if they, they think they're coming or they have questions about it, and that'll give us some a bit of a gauge to know um, how active that event might actually be. In the middle, in the November, we often do a, our version of a, a Movember, we call it Movember, and it, it allows us to interact with ranchers or some of our other partners and create more of a storyline that can be ongoing and updated. And then on the left, more of a product-based thing. So we still do use Facebook quite a bit. A lot of the stuff that's on Instagram, it can be automatically copied over to Facebook, so it's not a lot of extra work. But there are times when we're very specific about how we use Facebook for a given bit of marketing. So, uh, the next one would be Twitter. And there again, I mentioned before, it's more of a real time kind of thing. So it'll be kind of the day of or the night before. We'll call out something uh, specific to a product, um, an event that we might have participated in, or we think that customers should participate in. And we find that. Um, Customers really like the fact that sometimes we'll post about events that actually don't even include us, but we think are worthwhile sharing with others that are still somewhat in the agricultural vein. So they, they, they trust our judgment on those kind of things. So, so that's Twitter. And then the final one is LinkedIn, which I mentioned is a little more um, uh, geared to a little bit of a different customer, maybe more business to business. It allows us to use videos like a video on the left talking about our a move a few years ago to our new head office on the ranch and what we had done and and then partnerships we do uh, partnerships with companies the one in the middle is with a beer uh, a microbrewery in alberta or sorry in ontario and so we'll call that out and share in the postings and whatnot with in this case with creamore springs and then there could be other ones that um, tie into other businesses that might use the farm for their own events or something like that we can support and and uh, do things like that so I think we're almost on the time. Uh, the last one was just uh, a friendly goodbye from one of our uh, young Angus calves at the uh, at the home ranch. So hopefully I've been able to, although, like I said, I'm not terribly technical in this area, but very familiar with having done direct marketing now for 30 years. Um, and uh, hopefully these examples resonate with some of you and I'm open to answering any questions anyone might have about things that maybe worked or didn't work for us. And if I can't get the answer, I'm sure I can find somebody on our end that can help that help with it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that presentation. I think it was a perfect complement to uh, John's presentation, sort of, you know, here's the, the technical behind the scenes 
uh, stuff that you need to do or tasks you need to do to you know, run accounts like the ones that you've shared with us here today. And um, yeah, very, very inspiring and very beautiful. And, and one of the um, one of the things that really jumped out at me is your tagline, you know, sharing what matters and then always kind of going back to the tagline to direct whether it's what you're posting on social media or what you're doing in your business. And it makes me think of Organic Valley and, you know, it isn't a tagline, but you know, their, their mission at the beginning was very simple. It's to save the family farm, right? And and mm -hmm. I still remember it despite not, you know, being connected with them for quite some time now, but it, it just really is easy to remember and it is your guiding principle, right? So that's something that um, regardless of what you're, you, you know, you're trying to, to sell or market or share, you know, being really clear about, you know, why you're here is, is important. Um, for sure. You know, to act as a touchstone, it, it, yeah. It's cliche, but it's it's about repetition, and and mm -hmm. the repetition starts internally. So we need to make sure we constantly address that insofar as that tagline before we can even go out, you know, to the customer to the marketplace and offer it. And you're right; it, as long as we constantly come back to that, I think we stay on course with with the strategy. Yeah, and you know, and and know what to know to say no to, right? As well, yeah. which sometimes is. The, the harder bit when you're, you know, especially I think when you're, when you're starting and you're trying, you know, to get things going. Um, but the sooner you're really clear about what it is you're trying to build, um, you know, makes it easier to make some of those decisions, some of those hardest decisions. Um, so there is a question that's just come in. Um, and uh, what would you say is your biggest certified organic purchaser, direct to consumer or restaurants or other? Um, I would probably say e-commerce. Uh, we predominantly do organic on our e-commerce platform, right? And um, it's probably all all together. I'd probably say it's the largest. We have um, uh, some smaller grocery stores that take regular weekly deliveries of organic and whatnot. But um, as a whole, I would say our direct to consumer is probably number one for for organic. Yeah. So listen, Jen, that was that really um, it reminded me of something else that really struck me about about your presentation is just you know, diversification, right? You have a number of, you know, and 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 um, the utilization of all of your animals through your different, um, you know, brands are part of your company. So that was that was really interesting to me as well. Yeah. And, and kind of analogous to the animal itself, right? It's like, how do you use every bit? Like, how do you market as many, you know, parts or, you know, cuts of the, of the animal as you can, so. Right, I mean, it's, we, we call it carcass optimization. I'm sure other people on this call probably have their own terms for it, but we use brands as a strategy to optimize every carcass. And, and that it, yeah. it'd be far simpler to have one brand and do everything under that. And some professional marketers would tell you, you should just stick to the one brand. And, yeah. But we found it's worked better for us to have multiple brands in, in order to ensure that we move every pound of every animal. Yeah, no, that's... Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. Um, are there any any other? Any, I don't want to uh, dominate the the conversation and the question time. So please, um, if you want to turn your mic on, if you have a question, or if you want to throw it into the chat. Um, so great info, thank you. Uh, when you market, do you work by cuts and or sides, quarters, etc.? When we started, we did a lot by quarters and sides uh, when we had our first butcher shop in, in the small town of Brussels. But I'd say it's been about, about 15 years that we've gone to pretty well just marketing cuts. It, it, we, could, we could sell quarters and sides. It's a little more cumbersome. It's, it takes a lot more work to educate the customer about what they're buying and to give them a sense of value uh, once they, you know, they, they make the effort of weighing all the cuts, it doesn't always equate to what they paid for on the original quarter or side. And we found we were spending a disproportionate amount of time always trying to explain that. And once we figured out a way to sell by individual cut, it, it freed us up to do better marketing and more selling instead of always trying to explain. And then what, what we've been able to do then over time, once you get that established, is then you build it back the other way where, whereby now online, for example, most of our sales are in boxes of say 10 steaks or X number of um, uh, bags of jerky or hot dog. And so you create bulk buys 
that give the perception of more value, um, but they're not quarters and sides, which I think are just, just a tougher sell. And, and certainly for us, where the bulk of our market is in the cities, people just don't have freezers big enough anymore for, for, uh, to be able to buy like that. And so it, it works much better for us to sell individual cuts and then those that'll take them, buy those in bulk. Yeah, no, that's, that's really interesting because that's what popped into my head right away too is the freezer space. And um, I was just thinking, of, I don't know, relatively recently, you know, I learned that in a lot of big cities or larger cities in the US anyway, and maybe in Canada as well, they're actually building, you know, condos without kitchens. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And it's like, wow. So people are eating out all the time or ordering in or whatever. Right. So really knowing, you know, again, I guess it just points to really, you know, understanding and knowing your consumer base. Right. And yeah. selling them what they want rather than what you think they should want <laughs> or how it's yeah. always been done. Right. So, yes, yeah. that's often the problem. That's often the challenge. We have um, two apartment buildings in Toronto that we service that actually have put in uh, shared chest freezers in their on their main floor or maybe it's the parking level but they'll rent space within these big um, they're they're like small walk-ins not they're not old school chest freezers but they're like yeah. walk-ins and but for that very reason some people do still want the ability to be able to buy something in bulk and freeze it but their condos don't give them the space to do that anymore so they've figured out solutions by having different apartment owners actually share with some of that freezer space so we need to pivot and figure out a flexible way that we can help fill their freezer, even if it's not a traditional yeah. uh, market. Interesting. Yeah, mm -hmm. fascinating. Um, any, we still have some time for questions. So um, please, please jump in. Um, Hi, I'm just going to jump in here because I was looking yeah. at Zach's comment because I'm from Manitoba as well. And he was saying it's hard to direct market beef because there's hardly any local abattoirs that are certified for Gannett. So Mike, I was just wondering, you guys went um, vertically integrated quite early on. Is that one of the things that you experienced as well and why you decided to start open your own butcher shop and, and process animals as well? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I've been asked that before and I, I wish I could say, oh no, I had this, I had this 30 year vision and it was gonna be this and that, but it never is. And, and I think the, uh, what we were very successful early on direct marketing. And because of that success, we were getting customers asking us for more customization. They wanted their pork chops cut an inch thick instead of three quarters of an inch or you know, smoked a certain way and not the other way. And so because we were successful early, we realized if we wanted to stay ahead of that, we needed to do it ourselves because I couldn't be dependent on a small local provincial butcher shop because frankly, they, that wasn't their business model or whatever. So that kind of launched us into it. And, and then one thing led to the, the other. I think the acquisition of the bigger plant in Alberta was largely because the cattle, we realized we weren't gonna be able to have enough cattle to meet the market demand in Ontario. And so, we started looking into Saskatchewan, Alberta, made partnerships there. Those herds became you know, more and more. And then the realization was, well, we need to harvest the animals closer to where they're raised. And so then that, but then that opened markets in Europe that I had never in my wildest dreams thought we'd ever tap into. So sometimes it's a zigzag route. I think it's, it's more about what you do with when you've got at the end of each zig, what you do with that. And I think that's kind of led us this way, but certainly it is. I, I think it'd be very hard today to start something like this if you didn't have some degree of control over the processing or something. I know we struggle sometimes with that, even with our hogs in, in King City. We have a small herd there that we raise outdoor and we have customers already picking out their pigs long before they're harvested, but we struggle to find processing sometimes. Even though we're in the business, um, it's, it's very difficult. So yeah, I hope I answered your question without turning you away from the idea. <laughs> I'm in it because I love it, but yes, it, it does take some tough decisions and, and willingness to, yeah, like I said, to zigzag back and forth because it's not a straight line. For sure, thank you for that. And we've had another question come in. It's like, what is your experience with grass finished beef? Well, we're, we're, we're in it. We do a fair bit of it. Uh, not nowhere near as much as our grain finished, um, but we, we, we wish we could. Uh, we learned early on that the, the challenge with grass-fed, I think you made the point earlier, Marla, about 
telling customers what they should get versus what they really want. And as, as a, a rancher, seeing the health of the animal when they're strictly grass finished, it, it seems like a no brainer. And so you, you tend, I think early on, those of us ranchers that were really excited about grass farming and, and, and the awareness that was suddenly in, in coming from the marketplace, we were just so happy to get them grass fed animals that we, we failed to realize that ultimately the, the quality and the taste has to exist in order to enable us to make that second sale and so forth. And so I think I found it's been probably eight years or so now that we've been really working at figuring out ways to uh, improve the quality of the grass finish. Because if I had my dithers, I would rather it all be grass finished. It just, mm -hmm. it's challenging to get there with the right quality. It's been challenging. I mean, the last six, eight weeks in Alberta and in Saskatchewan, I mean, the weather alone would make you wonder if you could ever, you know, um, do it all with on a forage base. So there's yeah. there's intricacies about that, but ultimately, I'm yeah, we have experience with grass farming. I think it's getting better. I think the quality, the standard of quality, is slowly raising or rising rather. Mm -hmm. I think we're learning to tie in the right breeds as well, which I think early on was somewhat non-existent and you can't just take any cattle beast and think it can be finished on forage i think so we we we've, we've been learning a lot and thankfully there's a there's a consumer base out there that have been patient with us and when i say yeah. us i mean our, the whole industry so i don't think we've lost that opportunity but it hasn't been fully tapped into yet perfect well, I, I have a question marla absolutely i was going to say we have time for one more sure uh, um, yeah I think one of the biggest uh, advertisers on TV is a and W they're advertising their meat is free of uh, hormones and steroids. Now that a lot of people take uh, as a conception that that is organic meat, but really it isn't. Uh, what do you have to say on that kind of a comment? Uh, well, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm kind of caught on that because we're, a and W is a very good customer of ours. We've done a lot of work with them. We were doing, supplying them with um, antibiotic-free and hormone-free beef before they switched to grass-fed beef, which I uh, were of a, a year, a year and a half ago. Um, my daughter was on uh, several of those commercials, those TV ads. Uh, that was our farm in King City that was with the burger out in the field talking to the Allen spokesperson for A&W. So I have to be very careful <laughs> how I answer that as because uh, they are a great customer. I think... Um, I think the world of them, just insofar as they're willing to rock the boat and push the envelope, and there's always going to be doubters and naysayers, um, but they've they've made big inroads with their coffee, with the, the, the straws that they use, the recycling of the straws. The, they, we've had, I've had calls from them periodically, we talk about every quarter, but I've had calls from where they've asked about carbon footprint. Um, they've, they've questioned whether or not all this nonsense about amount of water that it takes to grow every pound of beef and stuff that we're always bombarded by. They're actually questioning that and wondering if, they're, if they could put together research money, would there be a way to, to um, validate or disclaim those kind, of, those kind of that research or that data and stuff like that. So, I mean, I look at them going, that's what we need. We need someone with their clout to yeah. keep pushing the envelope. And um, yeah, so I, yeah. I, but again, there's always going to be some doubters. I, um, a portion of their meat still comes from offshore because they can't get enough in Canada. And, you know, should we sit back and beat them up over that and criticize them? I mean, if they're going to take 40% of their supply or 60% is Canada, that's still a heck of a lot more than it used to be. And let's be grateful for that and figure out a way that we can all together get it to be 100%. Yeah, I talked to I, one organic grower in BC and he said he tried to get in with him. He's an organic grower and uh, he said there was too much red tape involved that uh, they wouldn't accept his business. So I'm not sure what's all involved. You mentioned they're buying offshore beef. So, uh, you know, I don't know how much red tape is involved. Yeah, not a lot, to be honest. Um, I haven't found that. I The, the challenge that A&W has, of course, is you know, they're in the business of selling meat patties. They have no interest in steaks and roasts and tenderloins and all the rest. So if ranchers that call them that have small herds that want to sell them whole animals, despite their best efforts, that's just not their business model. They're in the business of selling patties, right? And so right. Um, that's where they work with companies like us that can take the rest of the product and sell it elsewhere under other brands to make sure that they have enough ground beef to make their patties and stuff. So 
Um, I'm hesitant when I hear that, just I'm not sure how, when they say it's difficult, I'm, I, don't, I don't think it's that difficult, particularly if they're organic already, um, they've already checked several of the boxes, uh, but the chances are they're probably very small, probably not located near a facility that processes for A and W, which in turn makes it more complicated and so forth. But that's, mm -hmm. yeah, that's my honest answer. Thank you. Yeah, and I really appreciate that. And, you know, I always think that, you know, we, we definitely have to hold companies like A&W and others, you know, like accountable, but we also have to allow them to like to change and grow, right, and learn. Sure. And and I think that, you know, what you've just described, um, you know, uh, you know, points points to, you know, a company that, you know, that's, that's uh, you know, at least trying. So, um, yeah, no, that, that's really great. And I did say that that, would get, that was going to be the last question, but I'm going to sneak in one more um, because it's, I think, very, um, uh, you know, important to this group in particular. Just what are your thoughts about the future of certified organic beef? Hmm. Um, well, a, a, a positive through COVID has been, we haven't seen a, a change in organic um, the organic demand, particularly on our e-commerce site. And one of the, the beauties of e-commerce is in real time, you can gauge customers' responses and you get feedback from them immediate. And so it's, it's different than a business that goes through a wholesaler where you're beholden to the meat buyer or somebody giving you any feedback, right? So by, by having direct access to the customer, we, we have that direct line. So we're able to, to really gauge trends and changes. And when Prior to COVID and when COVID hit, and then now as we've kind of gotten used to living with life with COVID, the organic business has just kind of chugged along, uh, it continues to grow. When I said earlier, our e-commerce growing overall, I meant the number of customers. But I think the, the actual amount that any given customer buys has traditionally slowly grown, but it's been steady and it's weathered pandemics and things like that. That to me is very positive. That, mm -hmm. Those customers that are that are committed to that, they've they've done their research, um, they know enough to know the difference between certified organic versus non, and they're so they're in. So that's my positive answer. My my negative answer is the the struggles everyone in the calorie industry is is having with feed costs are heightened in the organic world. It just seems so. Um, I think the future of organic is really going to be dependent on what happens with feed because we lost quite a few producers this past year in Alberta and Saskatchewan that when we called, called them to buy their cattle or buy their stalkers or whatever we normally, they've already sold them. They sold them in the commodity markets due to lack of feed or high feed costs or whatever. So my, my fear with the high feed costs is just, we might have a very limited supply for a while right. before it can grow again. So I, I gave you a positive and a negative to your question. <laughs> that's, that. No, 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 that's, that's, the reality i would suggest so thank you uh thank you so much for that um and mike you are going to stick around for uh the networking session so folks will be able to to answer sure. ask you some questions there too so thank you again to both um you know mike and john for your presentations like i said earlier um incredibly complimentary and i uh, really appreciate both of your uh time uh both in preparing and for being here today uh doing your presentation and answering questions